City Council members have announced their plan to disband the Minneapolis Police Department. We're calling for defunding the police. Shootings in New York City have more than doubled this year. Thursday, it's the comm center with Drew Breezy. You are in the comm center and you are with Drew Breezy. Drew, how are you doing? What are your uh, what are your, the detailed plans for your Valentine's Day coming up? Go ahead and spoil it. Uh, every year on Valentine's Day, uh, the uh, fiance and I get matching coffins. And we, uh, because we, are, we sleep like Rom, Rob Zombie. So we're, uh, no, no, I'm, I'm fucking with you. I, I, I don't want to divulge my, uh, my plans uh because tell us where you can find you and when in tampa on on friday oh shit is that friday already or th what day is it tuesday oh, no um probably here if i had to guess uh having a nice romantic dinner uh if not with the two children here um one incessantly talking about taylor swift and the other talk uh, the other um, quizzing me on the various flags of uh, the World Cup because oh, he is a weird. genius. He is a young genius, and she, and so is she. She's a she's a young Taylor Swift genius. Do you like to cook? You like to make a little romantic meal? Pop I do. I, I'm a I'm a steak fella, and I love to. Uh, uh, I, I don't use the grill out on the driveway like somebody else I know who has a beard. By the way. If you enjoy John's beard, I want you to put a one in that chat. And if you dislike John's beard, I want you to put a one in the chat. Heads I win, tails you lose. Okay. So uh, for Valentine's Day, thank you for asking. I'll take some chicken breast vinegar, Italian dressing. I put it in a Tupperware for seven to 10 days. Just really let that marinate. Then I'll microwave that for over an hour and I'll serve it on a bed of fettuccine or spaghetti. Oh, I would serve that on a bed of roses. Now, is that um, does that tenderize the meat by by letting it soak in vinegar? I would think that the acid would just either bring it back to life, cause, like it's formaldehyde, or it would just completely break it down, which you could do in a crock pot. In the south, I would actually cut it up almost like a crudite and serve it like sashimi raw, but uh, we call it candy chicken in the south. Okay. Are there any pecans involved? And are they pecans or pecans or pecans? Drew, we got any voicemails this week or are we passing on that this week? No, we got uh, we have plenty of voicemails. Uh, we'll get to them in a minute. I, I have a news story I'd like to talk about first uh, because it's something relevant to the uh, communications industry and to the first responders out there on the street. Um, I, I think that this would have implications in the fire world as well. This comes from Law Officer. It's an article called Georgia Police Now Live Streaming 911 Calls Straight to the Patrol Units. It's a program known as Live 911. So uh, this police agency in Georgia is singing the praises of a Live 911 system. It allows patrol units to hear directly from 911 callers cutting response time and better equipping field officers with direct information. Uh, this is in Brookhaven in Georgia. They began using the state-of-the-art techno uh, technology back in October. And at last check, their agency was just one of 78 police or fire departments nationwide to use live 911. Uh, the lieutenant who is handling this project said that the new live streaming technology uh, having their patrol units could save lives and it could help make arrests, not to mention uh, it can also help officers and, and citizens be safer. Um, what what a, a, a essentially happens is that they're listening to the 911 call uh, as it's come, as it's in progress, it's coming in. It's like we, it, she, her direct quote is, "We no longer have to wait to be dispatched to an incident. The officers can hear it live, determine what resources are needed, and we can start moving those resources to an incident." So imagine the implications it would have in the fire industry, which would probably be a little bit uh, greater than in in uh, law enforcement, because uh, they're very particular in what equipment goes and, and you know and what's needed and sometimes that's where the breakdown occurs for us in law enforcement we're already out on the street 
so uh, we carry our equipment with us. Uh, we're pretty much ready all the time. Uh, we are not sleeping. We're not making chili. We're not playing Super Nintendo. So uh, the live streaming of the 911 calls is uh, it, it's kind of uh, helpful in the sense that at least you know what you're getting into is it a domestic, uh, which falls right in line with the with the uh, topic tonight. Well, uh, I, I had a quick story about the live 911, if you don't mind my sharing it with oh, our, yeah, our, please our do. dozens of fans out there. So Drew texted me about this live 911 thing as we were searching for a topic this week. And uh, I, re I read the article that he sent to me and as, you, he, as he just did to you about these calls going straight through to police cars. Well, I happened to be getting gas at that exact moment. And I saw some of my cities, the uh, finest uh, on their lunch break. And I walked over to him and waved to him, and they did this thing where they waved back without rolling down the windows because they really don't want to talk to me. <laughs> and then, cool. and then uh, I said, uh, "Hi guys," and they're like, "What's up? What's happening?" I'm like, uh, "Nothing much. I just have a quick question for you." And I said, uh, "I'm actually a podcaster, and I could actually see their eyes roll on the inside of their shades. They were wearing dark glasses. You could actually hear like the mucus spinning around just their eyes." <laughs> and I said, "I just had a quick question for you." And like they already put the car in drive, like they want to leave, you know. And I said, you know, I'm researching this thing out in Georgia where they possibly live stream 911 calls straight to the car. Uh, is that something you guys would be interested in hearing callers from inside your patrol car? And we had kind of a rookie, kind of a veteran. They were possibly getting ready to do a new show on NBC this fall. And they both said no, vehemently, that that was a bad idea. They said, actually, what we've got is we've got dispatchers who take the calls and it comes in on our little computer over here. And he's like pointing at little bars. I'm like, oh, how interesting. And, and I said, so you wouldn't want to hear the, you know, the voices of callers and you would be able to like maybe hear cadence or tone and, and be able to really, really understand, you know, what cries for help would be like. And they said, the only thing we would hate more than that is a common citizen approaching us while we were trying to eat lunch, asking a stupid question. So they hit lights and sirens and they drove out of the parking lot, but a block away, they turned them off. So. I don't think patrol units are particularly wanting to do that. And I, well, I, have, to, I have to wonder what, how, how the uh, line officers in Georgia must really feel about that. I have to, I also have to question your sample size because you talked to two dudes in. I Alabama. talked to two well, more real people than you did. Well, that's true. No, I actually, I talked to a chief of police if you must. And, oh, chief, look at this. The admin goes to the chief and I go to the line guys who have well, to actually implement the system. He hadn't actually spoken to anybody that's used it, but he definitely spoke to people that, uh, whose agencies are using it and they're raving about it, but he, but he conceded, you know what? That's a good point. Maybe, maybe all of us administrators are just really psyched about this thing and nobody really asks the officers or the dispatchers, but the article does say that Mark Winnie, a reporter with the WSB TV road with officer uh, McCoy from the Brookhaven police department uh, and noted the first day he used live 911, it made a difference getting him to a scene where a man with a bat had threatened an apartment worker. It said, we were there in easily less than a minute, McCoy said, and we came off the elevator and he was actively holding the baseball bat in an aggressive manner. So, yeah, but if they didn't have live 911, they probably would have been there anyway. I don't think that live 911 moved them in range with, you know, within a minute, did it? Um, I don't know. I, I, I do think that it does kind of take away the priming aspect that I've spoken about before where, you know, where, where saying, a dispatcher acts as a middleman between the car and the police. That's what it eliminates. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, there's going to be pros and cons of this thing. Okay. But, all right. I'll stop bashing it. I just wanted to take a side that was against your side for a change. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. Uh, but you know, your two officers don't like it. So obviously we're just going to cancel it. I, yeah. It's, you know, they represent all. <laughs> I don't, I don't blame you and I don't blame them. Uh, so we will maybe talk of, or maybe we will go to a voicemail or two. How about that? We love the voicemails. The only thing that we would ask is that we maybe employ a little bit of brevity. Uh, we want to hear your stories. We want to talk to you. That's why we encourage you to call into the show. You guys could call us and talk to us about anything, particularly the stuff that goes on in your law enforcement careers. But we're listening to these things. And sometimes they're just they're just kind of long. So if you do have a fun story, please do call in. Please share it with us. But just remember, uh, brevity is the thing, man. Kind of parse it all the way down to, to just the bare bones so we can get it on the air. It's I'm going to take some of the voicemails we have there a little bit long, and I'm going to edit them, and I'm going to make it easier for us to play them on the air. So we do appreciate you guys calling us. And I've talked to a bunch of people who left us voicemails on Instagram and other platforms, and it's a lot of fun to reach out and talk to our fans. I love anybody who participates. I don't, please don't get me wrong in that, uh, in that respect. Um, however, a voicemail, just think about 
think about re- receiving a voicemail. Would you like Drew and John to leave you a four minute voicemail? So here's a, here are a couple, here's a sampling and I hope to God I have them in the right order. Oh, well, never mind. <laughs> All right. There are no voicemails. I lied. I made up that whole story about there being 11. I made up the stories about there being even any fans that I've interacted with. No, I, there are we have paid actors do those voicemails and, the check must have bounced or something this week. Hang on, I know what the problem is. So, John, all right, never mind. These are genuine okay. voicemails. People call us every single week. Voicemail time, Drew. Good no. morning, Drew and John. This is Jim from Florida. First time caller, long time listener. At least three episodes. Just wanted to say you guys are doing a good job breaking down some of these important topics in the communications world. I've been in law enforcement a little while and have a great appreciation for comm center personnel. They are heroes in headsets. Their story, the things they hear, and the trauma they are exposed to are topics that are little known or given great importance. Recognition for their contributions to public safety is long overdue. On a side note, I read on the internet, internet, the state of Florida legislature is working towards extending PTSD benefits to crime scene technicians and 911 dispatchers, which is a move in the right direction. This would be huge as comm center personnel are truly first responders. Keep up the good work. Appreciate everything you guys are doing. It's a 10-7 commute guy. I figured I should have put a translation in there for my American friends. Hack in the dark, I'll use my court voice, is smoking a cigarette. How dare 10-7 canoe guy assume that I don't know what hack in a dart is? Being the hockey fan that I am, growing up on the Canadian border as I did, and understanding his lingo in his 10-7 canoe story. Uh, however, I, I, you know what I admire most about this? It's relentless follow-up. Complete follow-up. I like that we have our own insular fans, like 10-7 Canoe Guy, which I hope he just changes his handle to 10-7 Canoe. Unfortunately, the only euphemisms I know for smoking a cigarette would probably get us pulled down off of you. Oh, right. I'm going to refrain from mentioning that. Please don't. And I wish I had known you guys were going to talk about Paul Pelosi on the episode The Call Got Aired On, because, well, if you ever saw South Park, everyone in Canada knows everyone. Scott's a dick. And uh, my extended family owns a prominent business in the little town the hammer holder was from. And uh, my wackadoo cousin happens to know the guy. I wish I had been able to talk to you guys on the phone and fill you in about the shithole town that guy came from. Have a great afternoon. Bye. Little known fact. Hey, fellas. It's Kiefer and Dan from the One More and I'm Out of Here podcast. How are we looking? Wanted to uh, respond to Jonathan's Instagram post that he put uh, from at King James. Jonathan, you keep up the good work, sir. Don't let the man get you down. LeBron doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. Well, you know, he hangs around with a lot of big shots to pay a lot of money. So his shit looks right. But I, I say you're right. See you later, King James. We got your guys back. Looking forward to Thursday's show. Hope you guys have a great week. One more and I'm out of here. One more and we're out of here. Hundred percent. Thank you guys. I appreciate that uh, Kiefer is staying up late at night, uh, nursing beer after beer after beer, thinking about me. Frankly, if LeBron James even knew I existed, that would probably be a, a huge leap for us. Um, yeah, they're, those guys are, are funny. They're going to be uh, joining us out in, in Clayton, and uh, I, I do appreciate the fact that uh, they're big fans of our show. A hundred percent. hundred percent. All right. Uh, th- there's one more. Uh, there are actually two more that I want to play. I'm keeping an eye on the time though. So I'm taking a risk and I'm going to play this. Just take hopefully, a risk, Drew. Hopefully it's not out of order. Hey, comm center. How's it going? Um, just calling, um, was messaging with, uh, John tonight. It's about two in the morning. And I shall remain anonymous still. I work uh, overnights, I folks. With John tonight, he said to uh, give you guys a call, leave a message quick. So um, think of a story. I can't really think of any story, but as I was finishing up the uh, comm center um, episode, I was thinking to myself, I don't know how it came up. Someone mentioned something. Um, I don't know how it came up, popped in my head. But um, one thing that I don't think we really talk about as, 
dispatch, uh, dispatchers, uh, police officers, uh, first responders is I know that I've only been doing this for about six years now, but, um, lots of people say, Oh, I wanted to do that job or I could have done that job or, uh, whatever. Right. They kind of start with that. Um, or they say like you meet people that are like doing hotel security or mall security or something like that. And they keep on saying things like, yeah, well, I just, I'm just getting experience for the job. And that's kind of like what I was getting at was people thinking what they need to go to the Academy or pass interviews and stuff. And I think there's this misconception, general misconception of um, like now is a great time to get into policing because no one wants to do it. And, everywhere's really hurting right so um yeah so anyway like take me for example i didn't really want to i never even considered being a police officer until um yeah i was living on my own sharing a room in a house with some strangers and just had a dead-end job like sure i had some military experience but i didn't seek it full-time Okay, so <laughs> it's good, good to know that's kind of the end of the story. I didn't seek it for time. <laughs> well, join us next week if you want to find out how that story ends. <laughs> Case in point, this is what I'm saying. I, I love this guy. I love that he's working overnights. I love that he's texting you at all hours of the night. Join the fun. I mean, uh, like if you have a if you have more than two minutes worth of uh, commentary, I, and I understand that we're all working different shifts, so you're not able to necessarily call, but you certainly can call. The area code is 848. And the phone number is COM911. That's 848-266-6911. We hope and pray to get you on. Uh, we are hoping tonight to stimulate a little conversation uh, with this story that we're about to present to you. Um, so we do welcome all your voicemails. You're not going to be ridiculed endlessly like John wants to do. No, I'm the one that's here for ridicule. When you hired me, you said that that is what I was here to be. That was what I was here for, oh. to be the lightning rod of ridicule. So you could throw me overboard after your year and say that you finally cleaned up the act around here. Uh, hold on a second. I'm trying to find the right. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So uh, what we're going to do is, uh, I think, just get into the story tonight. Um, eight, uh, eight, 848- Com 911, that's 848-266-6911. That's the true phone number for uh, John and I. I would love it if you called us later, and we're just going to discuss the story now. So uh, are you ready to fire away, John, or should I start? Uh, yeah, go ahead. I, I, like, I like the way you tell a good story and the way I pick it apart. I think that's kind of our thing. So this occurred in a place called Spring, Spring Lake Township, Michigan. And um, this is a this is a nightmare of a call for a few reasons. We're going to play the first nine one one call, and what it essentially is it's it's a mid twenties uh, kid, gentleman, man who calls nine one one, and you'll hear what he says. He he's essentially saying, Just "Come get me, come arrest me. I don't want to be here. I'm having issues with my dad." His dad gets on the phone and another conversation ensues. Um, and then like without fast forwarding too quickly, the end of the story is the young man kills the father. He makes a second 911 call. It's very haunting and says, uh, I've just killed my father. And, and the rest is kind of history. Yeah, what happens, Listener discretion advice on that. That is a disturbing phone call. So just be ready for that. If that's something you're not interested in listening to, you know, Sure. What what and, and you're a thousand percent right because he is it's graphic. I mean, they they've definitely redacted the kind of the gory parts out of it. But um, you know, when your mind fills in the blanks, it's it's kind of traumatic at times. But <clears throat> so just to fast forward, just to, you know, just a foreshadowing, not a not a spoiler alert. He kills his father. He's he is seen roaming the neighborhood with a bloody hammer, and he immediately surrenders and everything he said on the phone kind of came true. So let's, it, 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 it's the what happened in between that I'm most concerned about or that I think bears the most discussion. So here, we're going to listen to the first 911 call, unless you got something else, John. No, go ahead.
Ottawa County, 911. Hi, this is Kenneth Boone. I'm not feeling safe with my dad right now. Come on. Come arrest me. 18674 Pawning Drive. Okay. And what's going on? You're not feeling safe with who? With my dad. With your dad? What's going on there? He's not acting like himself. Your dad is or you aren't? My dad isn't. Okay. He's threatening me. No, I'm not. He's scaring me. No, I'm not. He's scaring me. He's scaring me. He's scaring me. He's me right now. Yeah, he's threatening me. Will you hurry up? Okay. What is your name? James K. Bone. He's threatening what me. Is, what is going on today? Let me talk to her. Let me talk to her. Please. Ma'am, he's off his medications because I was messing up his liver. Okay. What is your name? James Spoon. Okay. And is, does anybody have any weapons? No. Okay. And he's off of what medication? Devapro. What is that? What is it for? Um, mental illness. Okay. Are there any weapons in the home? No. Okay. Has anybody been physically assaulted? No, yet, no. Okay. Are there small children there? No. Okay. Anybody been drinking or doing any drugs at all? No. Okay. And what is your son's name, James? Pardon? What is your son's name? Kenneth. Kenneth? Yes. Okay. And what's his middle name? John Boone. John. John. Okay. And what's his date of birth? Two eleven ninety four. Okay. Okay. Sir, so I'm going to get an officer out that way for you. Why would he say that he wants to be arrested? Because he knows that he could do something bad to me. Okay. And what is he making threats to do right now? Nothing. He woke okay. me up in the middle of the sleep, go get him a pack of cigarettes, and then he's starting to get in my face and double fist his fist. Okay. James, what's your middle name? K. Hey, Kenneth. Kenneth, okay. And your date of birth? 5-9-1955. Okay. Uh, we're, like I said, we're going to get some, some help that way for you, okay? I, I just want you to stay safe. If anything changes before they arrive there, I want you to call me back immediately, okay? Yep, thanks. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. Take it away, John. There's a lot of things to unpack on that, but it, all, all of it's, I would say, through hindsight. There's there's a couple questions there that maybe I would have asked that she didn't ask. Um, Abby in the chats noted that she asked about weapons twice. I'm wondering if that's because she's actually multitasking. She's working on multiple calls right now. We'll find out. And maybe you mentioned this when you broke it down the case is that deputies are already busy and dispatchers are handling multiple calls. But one question I might have asked is knowing that he just recently changed or went off of his medication. That's a huge time for folks that are dependent on medicine to regulate their mood that any time it changes, any time they go off of it or anytime that they're, you know, within 24, 48 hours of release from some kind of inpatient care. It's a, a really, uh, it's a hot time of high agitation for them. And it's a time when a lot of bad things are prone to happen. I also might have asked uh, the dad if when he has changes with his medicine, has he had a history of violent or aggressive behavior? Um, she tried several times to kind of establish the mood in the house, whether things was just a, a verbal argument or if things were escalating. He did say, you know, that no one had been assaulted yet, which is a very conversational way to imply that, you know, he believes that an assault is coming. But when you're talking to a 911 dispatcher, this may be one of her faults is that although we're, we, we try to listen for that sort of thing, we can miss it because it's a nuance, um, especially if we're busy, if we're distracted, we might miss a word like yet. We might just hear. We may be going through a protocol that says, has anyone been assaulted? Because she's trying to figure out if an ambulance is needed, if an emergent response is needed. And his answer was simply negative in her mind. It wasn't uh, that the situation is, is escalating. Uh, but that would have been my primary concern was, number one, 
if, if he's had a history of past aggressive behavior, uh, you certainly wouldn't think that someone would have no history of that and then go to this call from four years ago where he bludgeoned his father to death. You would, I mean, I'm not a doctor and maybe there are cases like that, but you would seem to think that there would be signs or indicators or escalation over time that that might happen. Drew, what do you think? Well, you bring up some great points. Uh, however, when when he gives the foreshadowing of, yeah, nothing has happened yet, um, we are looking at that through hindsight. The only reason we knew, we know that that's a, a poignant statement is because we know the end of the story. So the dispatcher in real time does not know the end of the story. She knows what's going on at that moment. Uh, Abby brought up that point about uh, she was asked or they were asked twice about weapons. I would have to go back and listen. I can't remember if he asked, if, if she asked Kenneth first and then James second, or if she could have been that first. or just like she said, was this a little bit of trickery? Uh, like, Hey, are there any weapons glancing over asking a few more form a few more questions than just going back and asking it like you're asking it for the first time yeah Sometimes. and being a yes or no question that would actually be a very high level dispatcher intuitive question to ask was that if it's not that you're talking to a second reporting party to ask them yes or no if there's weapons in the house that would it's, be a con cool. it's a confirmation and i and and i i've got the, the reason i have <laughs> i i take issue with this call because Ultimately, this dispatcher was punished. She was um, she was reprimanded. Now it was it was it was a letter of reprimand. She's going to have to live with the the death on her on her conscience anyway. And and here's how it happened, though. It, it's not as as bad as everyone would think. What, what happened was she classified this as a mentally ill subject or something to that effect whatever that nature code is in, and, and let's remember something about where this dispatch came into that they have, uh, I, I saw another video online of this place. It's called uh, Ottawa central dispatch. They have something like seven or eight law enforcement agencies, four or five fire departments. Like they're just a central dispatch for a bunch of municipalities and, and whatnot. So um, she took this call, she classified it as uh, a mentally ill person, which was a priority two, which means it's pretty high up there on the, on the chain. What they ultimately decided is she should have classified that as a domestic, which would have been a priority one. And somebody would have been dispatched at that moment. So th there's a lot of, there's a whole lot of second guessing and Monday morning quarterbacking, but you know, the agency would be remiss if they didn't address the fact that this, this person, you know, died um, just because of a misclassification of the call. And, and what that did, essentially, the, 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 when the call was classified as a mentally ill person in priority two, it just stat, it sat in a queue. And then there was a shift change. And then one thing led to another. Then the guys went and got coffee. You know, it just... It just happens that way sometimes. And and that's the only time that's really going to happen when somebody gets bludgeoned with a hammer. So um, it's just a series of very unfortunate uh, delays. Uh, and it took the second phone call to get somebody out there. And the second phone call is the haunting one. Do you have anything to add to the first? Um, no, I just I wanted to touch base on the, the lawsuit that happened, but we can address that after the second call. I do just want to, again, advise listeners, if this is something that you're not used to listening to, this is a disturbing phone call. It could upset you, could bother you. Uh, most of you are probably going to be all right, but uh, it would be okay if you didn't want it, if you wanted to skip over this part. I try to stay away from the blood and guts. I'm sure John does too. We've had enough of it in our lives. Um, so there isn't a whole lot of blood and guts, but it is kind of shocking the way he's so cavalier about what he's saying unemotional Ottawa County 911 Hi, I killed my dad Who is this? Kenneth Boone Kenneth? Kenneth, what's going on there? Come lock me up. Uh, you said you killed your dad? 
Yeah. How did you do that? With a fucking hammer. Okay, hold on just a moment, Kenneth. I'm going to get some help started that way for you. Where are you at right now? 18674 Pawnee Drive. Okay. Hold that. Listen, I, I do not want you to hurt anyone else. Are you able to put the hammer down? Nope. Hold on just a moment, all right? I'm getting some help started that way for you. You ready? Huh? Kenneth, where are you at right now? I'm at my, my house. Where are you in the house? In my fucking kitchen. Okay, and where is your dad at? He's on the fucking floor. Is he in the kitchen as well? No. Okay. Do you think he's beyond any help? Is there, do you think? Can... I'm going to finish my dad off right now. What's that? I'm going to kill my dad. Did you say you were going to kill him or you did kill him? I'm going to right now. I want you to go in another room. I know you're upset right now. You, did you say you hit him with a hammer? Yep. Okay, I want you to go into another room. Is he still breathing? Kenneth, hello. Well, I just very haunting, uh, obviously, and and uh, I I almost don't want to hear what was cut out of that because um, some of the news accounts I've read said that you could hear a lot of shuffling and a lot of screaming, which is uh, kind of daunting. I just want to commend that dispatcher. That's the call. I mean, there's so many calls I never want to take, but the call of uh, someone who sounds like that and says, I just killed my father. And, and he's really walking a line right there because he's, you know, the guy says, I'm going to go finish him off. And this poor dispatcher is both at once trying to de-escalate from afar saying, I know you're upset, but go to a different room, which is in his calm voice is top notch. He was not ready to take this call because none of us ever are. And at once, he's also trying to assess the condition of the patient. You know, is it possible that this guy could be saved? And unfortunately, the only person that can answer that question is the assailant. So he's he's doing both crisis de-escalation and trying to do a medical evaluation at the same time. And uh, I'm sure that dispatcher was, although you can't hear it in his voice, he was probably in a cold sweat because that's how I would be if I had to take that call. Oh, there's no doubt. Um, I, I think he was part in shock as well. Um, although, you know, being in that field, like nothing surprises you anymore, kind of, but, uh, hearing what that guy is saying, I, I think you're right. Like that's the punch in the chest that you never want to take that you're, you're now talking to somebody who is about to commit murder or has committed murder. Um, and he, I don't know that he has the benefit of, um, knowing that there was another 911 call in the system that this guy is off his meds and, and all this other stuff. Now the, the other side of this coin, so to speak, is that 
there are times when you will receive calls from people who are off their rocker or not uh, in transitioning in their medicine or whatever and have claimed to have killed their entire family. And you get there and that's completely not the case. Or, uh, you know, sometimes th- that's, that's a very common swatting call. Like um, the last swatting call I handled when I was on the street as a shift commander, uh, we were all racing to the scene because the 911 operator was keeping the person talking and he was describing how he killed his, his uh, girlfriend's parents and they're uh, on the bedroom floor on the second floor and blah, blah, blah. And then the first observation, uh, one of the sergeants I worked with was a, uh, he was a SWAT guy. He was phenomenal. And uh, the first observation he made when he got there was it's a single story residence. I think this is bullshit, but, you know, you got to treat it as if, and it was, it turned out to be BS. I mean, you talk about a rude awakening, you know, pulling people out of their own home at two or three in the morning at gunpoint, but getting back to this case, I mean, he's as calm as he can. He's trying to, you're right. Trying to elicit medical information. I mean, is he beyond help? I mean, you're asking the guy that just killed, you know, that just bashed this guy's skull and if he's going to be able to perform CPR or whatever. I mean, it's, it's, I would be nervous asking that question. Um, is is he beyond help because like i the last thing i want him to do actually is go in and check on him i want them those two people separated and that was actually a, a major point i wanted to make about whether or not this is a domestic call or a mental call and any kind of rising violence rising escalation kind of call um we don't know what happened between the first call and the second call the first call she said call you know dial 911 again if, if this situation changes gets worse that's common where we have to keep working. We have other things going on. We don't have a unit that's going to respond right away. So I'm not going to just stand a 911 call with you indefinitely until I can get somebody over there. I mean, that de- that's entirely dependent on the situation, of course. But um, she said, call 911 if it gets worse. No, no intermediate call was ever made saying, hey, he's coming after me with a hammer. Um, it's one thing that's often difficult when I handle domestics is that one thing you would definitely want to advise, if appropriate, is if you're talking to particularly the victim say you know are you able to get your car keys can you get in your car can you drive away can you go somewhere that you're safe separating the two people involved in a domestic or a situation like that is absolutely critical and sometimes it's successful saying like yeah i can go get in my car like i can go lock the door at least you know even if they don't have the keys to the ignition or whatever um, they can try something to put a barrier between them and the other person i other times i've been able to get them to leave the scene go to a gas station and i say you know, I'll have a police officer meet you at the gas station. And they're actually anxious for that because then they can tell their story outside the presence of their attacker. Um, I don't know what happened in this case. I'm not sure why they weren't advised to separate and go their separate ways. On some domestics, I advise the person calling me to leave the scene and they refuse to do it. They don't want to do it. They can't do it. You can just tell for whatever reason they're not going to comply. Uh, but it would have been helpful if while waiting for a police response, we could have separated these people. And I'm, I don't I don't know the the reasons why that wasn't attempted or why it wasn't a practical idea. There are uh, issues in the courts, believe it or not, uh, like it, it, it's, it probably has to do with what the district court of appeals or what the federal uh, not regional, but the uh, federal judicial circuit holds like in opinions like this, because I could tell you. Think of this scenario for you out there in in uh, inter- internet land. Police rarely hold liability for not acting. Police hold liability for telling you what to do when you act. So, what I mean by that is, if you if if the nine one one operator is on the phone with somebody. And they say, okay, well, I'm safe in my bedroom. I have a shotgun here. I just want you guys to get here. If the dispatcher says, well, I need you to put that gun away because the deputy is walking up to the door. Or if the deputy says, or the officer says, tell them to put the gun away. I'm walking up to the door. And they put the gun away and they're subsequently killed when they didn't have a means to defend themselves. It makes for an interesting argument. Anybody can hold, anybody can defend themselves in their own home and anybody can possess a weapon when a law enforcement officer is knocking on the door. It just complicates things, but that is the law enforcement officer's job to figure out who's holding the gun and who's the homeowner and who's not right. 
but it's, it's in the direction. So if you're giving directions to this guy, like, Hey, do yourself a favor, get in the car, drive to a gas station. And on the way to the gas station, he gets plowed by a truck. We have now directed that guy to his death, even though it, 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 the inevitable would have happened. He would have been killed in his, in his house, bludgeoned by a hammer. These are just things that weigh heavily on the dispatcher, on the dispatcher supervisor and on the administration. And, and, and of course on the, uh, the, the, the legal representation for the administration. Well, I'm so glad that you brought that up. Um, particularly that example. Um, I'll read to you from the article about this case. This comes from WOOD, which is a, a, a news station in Grand Rapids. This is the quote at the end of their article, which comes from uh, David Schaefer, who is the plaintiff's attorney in this case. Quote, by telling James Boone on more than one occasion during the initial phone call that she would be dispatching police or send help out that way for you, but then failing to dispatch a police unit to the location, Wentworth provided James Boone with an illusory sense of security and endangered his life and said failure cut and, and said failure caused James Boone's injury and death wrote plaintiff attorney, David Schaefer, as I said, well, I want to address that straight away with not only your example of someone fleeing or leaving the scene and getting plowed by a car and what this lawyer says, I am not an attorney, but I can tell you that when you become a dispatcher, you learn about the four elements of negligence. And of course this does vary by jurisdiction, but number one is you have a duty to care, which all 911 dispatchers have uh, a breach of that duty. You could argue in this case that there might've been a breach by not sending unit right away. I know that, um, Another unit, another police unit was on an animal call, which you would think normally is something that could wait for a domestic or even a mental situation. But then there's causation. So if you tell someone to leave the scene and they hit, get hit by a car and they die, it's not the 911 dispatcher's fault that some of their vehicle hit them. I believe causation is also one of the key elements in this case, because although the dispatcher did not send help immediately or they did not arrive immediately, or even if they had, the causation of this person's death is not the 911 dispatcher. They're not the proximate cause. Right. Now, of course, this is a civil suit. We're not going for, um, you know, proximate cause of a death is in a murder. But I don't see that there's any causation here. You can't say that simply by not having a police officer there would have would have made a substantive substantive difference in the outcome of the case. It's impossible to say for sure anyway. And of course, the fourth element is is damages, which we don't have to discuss because unfortunately the, the man did pass away. But those are the four elements that you need to know before you can, you know, prove negligence in the court of law. And I just don't see the the causation there for your example or for this case. I think the only thing that they could really argue about was whether or not delaying sending a unit right away was a breach of duty. And I think that's subjective and depends on a lot of factors I probably don't even know about. What do you think, Drew? It is very subjective. And that's, that's the problem with this whole thing. And um, that's why I say, you know, you put the burden on this dispatcher to uh, properly classify it, but, but did she, so their finding in their um, internal investigation was that she didn't properly classify it. However, my finding and your finding, I think, or just playing what was played, did she miss, I mean, did she completely, you know, get it wrong? And the answer is no. I mean, you could have chosen two paths. This is the, uh, the uh, weekly dragons layer reference, but you could have chosen two paths here. One of them is he's a mentally ill subject and he's off of his meds. The other path is this is a, this is a domestic because the guy is saying nothing has happened yet. And that's what they opted for. So uh, I, I, I'll tell you, I commend the person that did the, um, the investigation because they got on camera. They, they were the, uh, whoever it was, he was the director of that 911 center. And he could not be more complimentary on the way that these dispatchers normally operate a sp specifically the, the, the female operator from the first call. Like she's very diligent. She did, she does a fantastic job and she's, she's very caring and she's very on the ball. But on this one, because of a misclassification, it got held because it got held. There was a lot of time for this, you know, situation to work into what eventually became a bludgeon. Yeah. I guess I would say to 911 dispatchers, if you have a lot of discretion or if there's a lot of gray area, I would tend to overclassify 
you know, if you have two people in a house and they're arguing, go ahead and put it as a domestic dispute and advise the unit that that's holding. You know, uh, what you need to do as an M1 dispatcher is is punt that football of responsibility out of your hands and give it to somebody else. If you tell a police officer that this call is holding, that two people are in a family, a family dispute is in progress and they're unable to respond, you've done everything that you can. You've advised units in the field that they need to go to this and whether or not they can or can't respond is gonna depend on a number of factors. But when you hold that in the comm center and you don't give out that information to at least advise another unit that's holding, you are holding that football of responsibility. Although I just wanna say again that on this call, listening to that, if I had been the person who took that call, I would not have foreseen or reasonably foresaw the bludgeoning death of the father as the outcome of that. I would have maybe assumed it could have possibly escalated into an act of domestic, but I mean, you just never foresee an outcome like that. That was, that was extreme. Nobody mentioned a hammer. Nobody mentioned weapons. You know, listen, if I had a nickel, when I was a 911 operator, if I had a nickel for every time I heard somebody say, yeah, my, my boyfriend just called, he's on his way over here to beat me up. I, I mean, okay. He's on his way over. I mean, like, is he there? No, he's on his way over. So you, you don't know if he's on his way over, but you assume he is. And you got to play this delicate balance of like, it's not like I don't believe you. However, you have opportunity to escape at this point or, you you, mm -hmm. you know, you have other opportunities. And this is kind of the same thing. I mean, it's just, it's, it's kind of like you cannot, there is no crystal ball in that communication center. There, there is just, you have to go with what you're being told. And I don't see a whole lot wrong with how she evaluated the situation. Now, the, the only other thing to add it into the mix, and it, of course it made it into the lawsuit, was that um, there was a location history file associated with with the address. And I'm pretty sure that the 911 operator saw that. The news makes a big deal out of that, but I, I, can, I can also tell you from experience, <laughs> it, it, again, it, we, we talk about the frequent fly, flyer at least once a week on the, on this show. And there are location histories uh, that are sometimes two pages long. So uh, there's a reason for that. And not everyone goes to jail on every single call. And, and people just call 911 to, because uh, they're, they're having a fight over who gets control of the remote. Um, and so that those calls start to stack up, meaning over time, over a two or four year period, you'll see that you've been out to a residence 21 times and 19 of them were just complete bullshit. One of them you arrested somebody and one of them was a legitimate medical emergency that had nothing to do with law enforcement. So um, that location history file that comes up with, with each 911 call or with, with uh, any call that you're about to dispatch uh, is sometimes undervalued, but definitely sometimes overrated because you can't put a whole lot of stock into it. Like I, I do think that if you get a 911 call that's a hang up and you can't get a hold of anybody, you might want to look a little bit deeper into there to see if there's a medical history or to see if there's a stalker maybe in the person's past or something like that. Do you, do you have something similar in your uh, computer aided dispatch system? We definitely have those. We, I alluded to it last week, what you call a premise location or a location note. We also have in our name cards, she asked for both parties there, their name and their date of birth. She would do that to check for warrants. She would do that, look for any other paperwork on them that might be relevant. But I assume she was also checking a name card where you would have associated history, not only with the location, but with those two people. It's possible that um, maybe they had some information on one of those two people and that didn't get broadcast or that didn't escalate the response. Uh, for example, a, a common time where you would do that is suppose, you know, someone mentioned someone in a call for service and uh, you either know that person or you look them up and you see uh, a note on their card saying this is a sovereign citizen or this person is aggressive towards law enforcement or this person is known to carry a weapon or whatever it is. You know, those that's background information that you gather or you maintain as a 911 dispatcher that can affect future calls. And. She did ask for both parties, so I, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure what information that they had on the history of that house or the history of those two people, but that is always a, a game changer. And as a 911 dispatcher, I can tell you the places in my jurisdiction and the people in my jurisdiction who we worry about. I One time I was working and I had a 911 dispatcher immediately send a medical call 
And I'm not sure what was going on, but the call for service didn't start in the CAD right away. They just started hitting up the tones and letting the ambulance crew know what was going on. And I recognized the address as they spoke it out loud. And I said, you get a PD over there, unit over there first. We've got a caution note on that location. We want to make sure that before the EMTs get there, that you want the police to secure the scene. So let's have them stage nearby and have the police clear their approach. And that was just from my memory. I just got lucky from that. Um. I want to talk a little bit about the the kind of the rest of the story here. Here's here's a quick, you know, a snippet from the lawsuit itself. Uh, as the deputies from the Ottawa County Sheriff's Office were rushing towards the scene, Kenneth was found walking in the road in the neighborhood, covered in blood, carrying the the weapon used, a hammer. Uh, and after entering the home, James Boone was found bludgeoned to death on the living room floor, laying in a supine position in a pool of blood with copious amounts of blood spatter skull fragments and brain and brain matter surrounding his body. Uh, he was bludgeoned so violently that he was unrecognizable. It also says in here though, that he uh, had uh, 32 lacerations of the head and face and 10 stab wounds to the chest. So again, uh, are there any weapons there? Well, there's a hammer and there's a, a butcher knife in the kitchen. There's always a weapon. The weapons of opportunity, right? It's present in any home. Sometimes the question is, is there a weapon or not is, it's only really helpful if somebody has a gun in their hand, you know, especially if a situation is protracted or it's taking a long time, the amount of time it takes to procure a weapon, uh, it, it almost makes the question negligible. So circling back to earlier when she asked twice, you know, that's almost a question that you would, on a, if this operator had stayed on the phone was, does he have a weapon in his hand now? Or like, is he going for a weapon? Is he, right. you might ask that sort of question. Has, is, has there been a violent pass between you two? That was the key question to me is when he's changed his meds before, when this has happened before, you obviously know your own son. What do you think is going to happen? And I think he implied it when he said nothing has happened yet, but there should have been another question and another conversation had about what happens when he goes off his meds. But this is the whole mind circus that's going on at this point, because if you remember, Kenneth made the phone call and said that my father is my it's confusing. Father is yeah. and, 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 and the father's in the background saying, oh, come on. You know what I mean? Like he just, in other words, I'm not a threat to you. So again, this is like, it's just, it's kind of confusing. He, so you'll know, uh, Kenneth, uh, ultimately pleaded guilty, but, uh, mentally ill to first degree murder. So he pled guilty, but you know, with this mentally ill attachment mm -hmm. and that was back in September, 2021 in November, just this past November, he died of cancer while in custody. He was a young man, but he still died of cancer while he was in custody. So his little brother or younger brother, maybe he's an older brother, I don't know, uh, filed this lawsuit in federal court because now he's gone, his father's gone, and, and he feels that the dispatcher coding it inappropriately is what caused the death. So that's what the attorney filed. That would be my guess too, and I hate to be so cynical, but I'm guessing it's just a cash grab. You know, the government will just say what, what costs more, you know, to, to settle out of court or to actually you know, fight, fight this issue. And he's likely to, to just be on the basis of pragmatism alone, possibly get some kind of payout on that. But it's unfortunate that, you know, there was a reprimand for those dispatchers. I do have a question for you though, Drew, as an administrator and as someone in this situation, suppose you had a 911 call that went really bad and the 911 operators uh, questioning or conduct was something that you didn't really feel was uh, like you, you just wouldn't respond that way yourself, or you didn't feel like they acted appropriately or they were unprofessional or something. Would it be in the best interest of the agency to retain that person on suspension or would fire them, firing them, you know, soon thereafter? Would that make you look like an admission of culpability or is that something you and, the, and an attorney have a discussion about or how does that work exactly? Yeah, we do, we, that would definitely be a discussion for the legal section for an attorney. My personal opinion is if you're going to do an internal investigation, which is warranted, uh, just to make sure that um, all all of our protocols were met and all of our, like maybe we're going to uncover something that they weren't trained in or whatever. So you would probably want to take that person off the floor. I, I don't see them. I, I don't see punishing them as in taking their salary away while we're trying to figure out what, what, if they did something wrong, that's, I, I don't think that's the right approach. Um, but nothing would shock me, but, but the, but I, I think, um, I think they have a duty and an obligation to look very deep into um, doing a full investigation, which they did. And immediately they retrained their, um, their dispatcher. There's a new 
or they they retrained her. Let's see, written reprimands, counseling, and extra training. She received a ri- uh, written reprimand for not properly coding the call and for not putting more detailed information in there. Uh, there was a supervisor that was given a written reprimand for not contacting a sheriff's department supervisor when that call was holding like that, and then that later became policy. So the policy now is if there's a call holding for X amount of time, you need to call the sheriff's office of that jurisdiction for further guidance. Like, hey, can you get somebody to come over here or what do you want to do? What do you want us to do with this thing? Um, Teresa in the chats did bring up something. I I think that their other officers were tied up on uh, other cases, like there was a death case and there was something else going on. You mentioned the animal call. I know that they, uh, they talked about that too, but the, the guy that did the, uh, the investigation McWaters was, who is the, who was in charge of the place said that they are stellar dispatchers and they do heroic work. He just wanted to make sure that the public knew that they were, um, safe and that yes, they're still on the job. And this, uh, you know, perhaps by giving the written reprimand and changing policy are signaling that this maybe was avoidable, but he, he was quick to point out in his interviews, there is one person responsible for this death. And that's the guy holding the hammer or the knife or whatever he was holding. Absolutely. And it, 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 I don't, I don't think that that was reasonably foreseeable as, as an outcome of the event. And something else that we frequently talk about is the issue of qualified immunity. We talked about that some weeks ago and Drew kind of alluded to this earlier, but, you know, dispatchers have to operate with that sort of in mind too, because suppose, you know, I'm taking a call for a structure fire and I have someone who's trapped uh, on an upper floor and I tell them, look, you've got to get out of the building. And they jump out of that second or third story window and fall and break their legs and have a lifetime of medical bills or they fall to their deaths. Am I responsible for that since I told them to get out of the building? You know, and that's where qualified immunity for a dispatcher would come in. And for something like this, I don't I don't think that, you know, that's something that they would argue in court. But whether or not this was a reasonable outcome, I'm sorry, but listening to that, I just didn't. I mean, the caller, the first the first person who called was the perpetrator. So that in itself. It just really muddies the waters, but it makes me think that it wasn't a, a foreseeable outcome of that case. That's going to be brought that that's going to be up to the jury, the civil jury, like if, or, or the judge, but I mean, you know, and then they'll bring out all of their policies and I'm sure they're going to uh, experts. The they'll bring out other 911 dispatchers and say, would you have behaved this way if you were in that position as well? Right. But yeah, the, the, you bring a great point. I mean, it, it's, it's a matter for the courts to decide that's, that's kind of how the system works. And you would hope, um, that, you know, people would employ a little bit of pragmatism or, you know, just some common sense, but the, the, there's no such thing as common sense. Like the, the, the field that you work in or that I worked in at one point is so technical that maybe you can't understand, maybe you can't, um, expect a jury to just say, well, why wouldn't you just put it in as domestic? It's domestic because of this other factor that, that literally those were the words that came out of the guy's mouth. What's the medication for his mental health issues? Okay. So we have a mental health issue. So, you know, it's just, it's a very tricky uh, situation for the jury to have to figure out if she did the right thing or the wrong thing. John. I completely completely agree on that. And it's just a tough case. And it's it's just, it's an unfortunate that how that came out, but as I've said before too, there's no such thing as a perfect policy. You can't, uh, you can't administratively in advance address every single thing and expect everything to turn out okay. Sometimes things are going to go, things are going to end up terribly bad, even if you do everything right. So um, just, I I feel bad for the dispatchers to take that call and then have it, you know, further ruin their lives, not only having to endure the uh, emotional and mental anguish of having to deal with that, but then having it, you know, be placed at their feet as though that was something that they were responsible for. There, there is a, 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 a probably unquantifiable, if that's even a word, amount of survival guilt that goes on in a communication center. I, I guarantee if you walk into your communication center, whether you're an officer, civilian, or, or whatever, and you talk, you just have a conversation with any dispatcher, any, any dispatcher up there, any, especially the 911 call takers, uh, you will find that they are... Um, there is a call that they have that has stuck with them. And I'm telling you out of experience that they had absolutely no control over yet. They still feel 
the the wrath from it. They still lose sleep over it. And and mine was well over 30 years ago. Yeah, that's that is how it goes, you know, and uh there's no way to rationalize it too because you when you talk it out, hopefully you have someone you can talk it over with and you say, you know, I wish it hadn't gone this way or you know, when you're re replaying everything that just happened in your mind. When someone tells you like, listen, this is bigger than you, this is bigger than, you know, emergency response. When something like this happens, all we can do is respond the best we can and sometimes it's going to go better and sometimes it's not and you can't you can't lay it on yourself and say you know if only i had done this i could have affected a different outcome you rationalize it like that but it makes you feel zero percent better you still right. just you just process the emotions and you deal with it as best you can and you can't change the outcome no uh I will, i'm gonna go to a call here john if you want to go into am mode uh, this is just a blind call there's no um there's no comments on there. It's somebody from the 615 area code. And you might have to turn your YouTube down. Caller, are you there? 615 area code. All right. Uh, I'm seeing that John can hear the caller. I can't hear the caller. I am now seeing that... Uh, Everybody can hear me, but nobody can hear John. So we're just going to abandon the calls once again. Uh, I'm very disappointed that it didn't work out for us again because we have been working hard on this and we actually had it working at one point. All right. Well, uh, I think we're going to have to kind of wrap it up due to these technical problems, but I have to uh, wonder what the heck happened there because uh, we're doing everything just like we normally do. Did you share the screen and you made sure the audio sharing was on as always? I mean, did the whole thing. Oh, weird. <laughs> did everything that we've been practicing and practicing and practicing. Well, that's too bad because we had Abby. She just tried to call in. She's a big fan of the show. I think that call earlier, that mystery caller was actually Andrea. So that's too bad that we didn't get to have her on the show tonight. Oh, it is so disappointing to not be able to talk to people. Um, we will straighten that out so we don't run into this problem again. And uh, together we will join forces like the super friends or like uh, what, what was the, uh, what were those two? Uh, I'm told I'm dating myself with these old television shows, but there was uh, 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 two little superheroes and a monkey. Does anybody remember that from the super friends? Anyway. Yeah. They had like these two like things that could transform. I don't remember the one or two. Yeah, Wonder, Wonder Twin Twins. powers activate form of an ice cube, shape of an eagle. Like they could do uh, things. So, but, tomorrow, they, but they were they were unique to the cartoon. They weren't in the comic book at all before that point. So that was yeah. sort of interesting. What's the comic book? Uh, the Justice League, the Super mm -hmm. Friends. Not familiar. You're not familiar with the Justice League or the Super Friends? <laughs> Superman, not. never heard of him. If you want to support us, folks, rate us, review us on a Spotify, iTunes. If you want to support us, we appreciate you uh, liking us, liking this video. Hammer that like button, download, subscribe, hit the bell notification so you never miss anything that we post. Please encourage us. Make us keep going for another year. I love this show. I'm so glad to be a part of it. And I'm so lucky that so many people uh, have not stopped me from being on the show yet. Uh, and and nor will we ever especially if you're dressed like jim rockford as you are because i am a an 80s television baby as well so for jb however he wants to be called and me drew breezy good night us, goo goo